This afternoon's sermon is the next in our series expounding all 150 Psalms, God willing, one by one in consecutive order. We come then to the 16th, which I have entitled Facing Death Joyfully. I'll begin with a reading of the psalm. A Mictum of David. Preserve me, O God, For in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent, in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell Neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's Word. We all feel threatened by different enemies. And if you pause for a moment and think about external forces that worry you I'm sure some will come to mind or even matters that are not right in your own soul that are a threat to your well-being but ultimately uh, the last enemy scripture says is death and uh, though all people alike face such enemies some have found courage to face even this enemy, death, joyfully. And uh, that's why I've entitled the psalm, Facing Death Joyfully, we have a testimony from such an one in the psalm. And clearly, if we take the psalm at face value, and sincerely, which we should, um, the joy spoken of here is not feigned joy. It's not a pasted smile on the face. But an inner soul illuminating and exhilarating joy. Joy which is sincere and calm, confident and even exhilarating. Facing death with happy and eager anticipation and expectation. That is, by the grace of God, genuinely possible for us. And so I ask, wouldn't you like to experience that? Or if you, if you already know something in a measure of this joy, wouldn't you like to have more of it? Uh, you know, I, have, I read about that kind of joy here in Psalm 16, but I've also observed it personally in a few uh, dying Christians. And most everybody here will remember that we used to have a church member of Calvary Baptist Church named Gail. And Gail became terminally ill and she knew she was dying and she trusted the Lord evidently all the way to the end of her consciousness. And I told Gail that because of her, I I was glorifying God because I, I just... She, she so far in my life experience has been the best example of one who was a good steward of the trial of dying as a Christian. And she 
some of you who knew her will be able to join me in saying that she was evidently not afraid to die. And she was actually happy as she was wasting away, happy to see the Lord, uh, the object of her love and faith. Well, Psalm 16 opens a door into the secret place of a heart which is full of such joyful courage. Uh, We have here in the psalm, thought-revealing words, which may inspire us with God's blessing uh, to have the same faith as he did, that is, as the psalmist did, David in particular. So I want to follow uh, our normal course of verse-by-verse exposition. I have uh, five points uh, to divide the psalm up into its parts. And then a final point to show you an important New Testament passage and what it does with this psalm. So, beginning then with verse 1, the subject is a prayer request. And basically, it is encapsulated in the phrase, Preserve me. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. This is the first and only prayer request in Psalm 16. Um, The verb preserve means to protect or keep me safe. And um, it is connected to this confession of faith. I put my trust in you. The uh, original has the sense of I take refuge in you. Lord, it's a metaphorical way of speaking that God is portrayed as a shelter in the storm or a safe place from enemies. The particular particulars of whatever it is uh, threatening the psalmist are not spelled out. In fact, that's not even the emphasis of the psalm. It's enough to see that he knows that there are forces arrayed against him and that he's not up to saving himself but the Lord is good and the Lord is faithful and powerful and so he makes his petition to the Lord and asks for deliverance uh, because he trusts in the Lord and already this is highly instructive for those who would face death joyfully Um, I would make three exhortations from it number one like the psalmist We must recognize our vulnerability. Recognize our vulnerability. Uh, In in so-called Christian science started by a religion started by Mary Baker Eddy, uh, the the uh, basic answer to to threats of of evil and harm uh, is denying the reality of such. The Bible takes a very different approach. It is frank and, and, and very um, matter of fact and realistic in its view of evil in the world. Um, the psalmist knows he needs to be preserved. He admits that he is, he is vulnerable to harm. And this is, this is something we need to recognize about ourselves I think, I think not just those who adhere to Christian science, but many people have never come to this point where they deal honestly with the threats against their happiness and well-being, both in this life and in the life to come. And the reason people uh, basically, when, when bad news comes, they tend to stick their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 I'm not listening, I'm not listening, is because it can be terrifying. To consider how vulnerable a person is to real and lasting harm. The psalmist is not an ostrich sticking his head in the sand. He, and, and this is not just characteristic of Psalm 16. But you see this as a trait of God's people in the Old and New Testaments. There is uh, a recognition of real danger uh, to me. And, and it's from that sense of danger that the person repudiates self-confidence and cries out to the Lord in prayer, trusting him. 
And that's the second exhortation from this verse. Recognize there is salvation with the Lord. Yes, danger is real. Um, and we may be ruined at last, but God is the Almighty, the Merciful, and the Faithful. As I preached this morning, God is actually there. Uh, don't let uh, skeptics convince you otherwise. But beyond simply recognizing that God is the great Savior, we need to follow the psalmist imitation in this respect. Let faith in this God inspire your trusting petitions. Surely multitudes go down to eternal ruin with a mental assent that God is powerful to save people. But they do not exercise the kind of saving faith of saints. Mental assent to the reality of God and the faithfulness of God and the power of God and so forth is not saving faith. If we truly trust in the Lord, it's not just a philosophical abstraction in our minds that He, being God, can save us. We look to Him. And we call upon Him in prayer to be our deliverer. It's like the difference between the, the tax collector in front of the temple, Jesus described praying to Himself, I mean, the Pharisee praying to himself and the tax collector who truly prayed. You recognize in the Pharisee's so-called prayer, there was no, no request. He, he didn't need God, he felt, for anything. But it was the tax collector who, who smote on his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It was the, the uh, one of the two thieves crucified beside Jesus that looked to him and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Faith had it materialized into verbal, heartfelt, sincere requests of Christ to save. And you see that prayer request springing from a saving faith Right here in Psalm 16, the first verse, Preserve me, or deliver me, protect me, O God, because I put my trust in you. Second major thought of the psalm is in verses 2 to 4, and I'm saying, I'm summarizing it this way. The psalmist is saying to God, I embrace you and your people. I embrace you and your people. Now, starting with verse 2 through the entire psalm down through verse 11, the, the remainder is a confession of faith and a celebration of blessing addressed to God, ultimately. So there's no more petitions, but rather a rehearsal of the psalmist's uh, own happy lot uh, with thanksgiving, obviously implied, toward the Lord who hears his prayer to protect and preserve him. Of the God in whom he puts his trust. So, starting with verse 2, the psalmist says, O oh my soul. Now in the King James Version, that phrase is all italicized, which means uh, it's not directly found in the Hebrew original. But the translators felt it was useful to uh, give the English reader the sense of what's going on in the Hebrew. Um, and it does seem that, that the psalmist here is speaking to himself because he says, Thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. Now modern translations, at least the ones I consulted, leave out on my soul and just say, I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. And so forth. Um, well, this is a simple uh, example in Scripture of God glorifying speech. When the psalmist says to God, You are my Lord, he is glorifying uh, the Lord as God and in effect swearing loyalty to him. When he says, You are my Lord, this is the language of commitment. Uh, of course, being a Jewish man in those days, he would have been very conscious that 
the Lord and Israel relate to each other by uh, by covenantal um, terms, and God voluntarily obligated Himself to Israel in certain language, and He calls for them to be uh, dutifully bound to Him and in their responsibilities of the covenant. Um, here, it's not just corporate. Um, covenantal bonds but very personal ones as well O my soul thou hast said unto the lord thou art my lord my lord and uh, what was true of the nation was certainly had its application to the individual man writing the psalm and then verse 2 proceeds with language that is evidently difficult to translate from the hebrew i know that not because i'm able to translate from the hebrew but because I see the, a fairly wide variation in two different approaches of English translations to the verse. The King James Version says, as you can see for yourself, My goodness extendeth not to thee, that is, the Lord who is my Lord. Um, now, if, if that is correct, then the sense is uh, seems to be of... Um, the psalmist's personal unworthiness uh, for reward because because of God's self-sufficiency. Lord, when I worship you, when I obey your commandments, when I serve you with all my might throughout my days, that doesn't help you out at all because, Lord, you're God. You don't need me. You don't need anything I have to offer. When I worship you, you, you don't owe me one. Uh, because worship is my duty. My goodness doesn't extend to you. It doesn't help you in any way. But another approach of the translations is quite different. Um, and it's plausible as well, it seems to me. The ESV is representative and it says... I have no good apart from you. I have no good apart from you. And that also fits the context. It says, Lord, you are my Lord. And the rest of the psalm is saying how wonderful it is for the psalmist to have God as his own Lord and covenantally bound Savior from enemies. Um, and so this has to do, this sense of it has to do with praising God as the ultimate good. If I take all my blessings and, and put them together, Lord, I discover that ultimately they're all traced to you and really they all are you. You are my sumum bonum, my highest good. I have no good apart from you. I don't know which it should be, but those are the two major options for the second part of verse 2. Verse 3 and 4 are uh, complex, but by way of analysis, I believe what's going on here is David, the human writer, is giving his view of people in the world. And in keeping with the, the, the typical way of Scripture's uh, assessment of the human race, uh, so it is here uh, from God's perspective and from the perspective of the psalmist himself, there are only two kinds of people. There are those he calls the saints that are in the earth. And then there are the others who are idolaters. And so, um, again, comparing other translations I think can be helpful here. But the basic idea is David saying, look, I esteem the saints. Those who worship the Lord, they are the excellent ones of the world and in them is my delight. It's to say I love them and I approve of them and I disdain the rest. That is, those who hasten after another God. They are doomed, their sorrow shall be multiplied, verse 4. Uh, these who offer drink offerings to idols... I will have nothing whatsoever to do with their worship. Uh, verse 4, their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names into my 
lips. And and you know this is this is now not the first time that the Psalms have expressed the proper regard we should have for those who love God and those who hate Him. I am reminded of Psalm 15, which says, "The kind of a person who who has fellowship with God is the kind of a person in whose eyes a vile person is contemned or despised, but the one who but but he honors the ones who fear the Lord." So David is expressing that fundamental appreciation for those who are noble people in whom God delights. And um, he totally repudiates the, the idolaters who are doomed to destruction. Now, uh, that's the basic sense of these verses. And I think it's relevant to what I have announced as the theme of the psalm. Facing death joyfully. Look, let me draw a couple of inferences from these things. Number one, facing death joyfully requires a definitive and mutual commitment uh, to the Lord. The Lord and the individual. This is the, the language that comes from covenantal love of one who is actually converted. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. Unbelievers do not tend to speak that way about God. But those who love God and receive Christ are happy to speak that way. Secondly, uh, the true Christian, this is the second inference, the true Christian is, is growing toward God as sufficient and God as good. I have the great responsibility of preaching the word to this church and from time to time it comes to be that I should speak to you about how God doesn't need us. How that God is God delights in himself, God is self-existent, God is, um, is unchanging and eternal, and, and uh, we don't help him out at all. Uh, we grow in our understanding and appreciation of God's self-sufficiency, but also of God as the ultimate good, as the highest good. Just like the psalmist does here, depending on which way verse 2 is rendered. And then thirdly, the third inference I want to draw has to do with having the proper regard for people in the world if we would face death joyfully. Look, I found a statement on the internet that reflects a common bad attitude and it goes like this. I love God. It's Christians I can't stand. That's actually, I think, the name of a book I found. I love God. It's Christians I can't stand. But actually, taken seriously and strictly, this is quite impossible. Anyone who loves the true and living God also loves true Christians. First uh, John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And in the context, this doesn't mean your siblings you grew up with. It means the Christian brothers and sisters of the church. We love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 adds to our understanding when it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Look, no wonder death is disturbing to the people who identify more with the hell bound than with the heaven bound. Um, one telltale sign of a person that is not ready to die is, an, is, is a person who persists uh, in an adult refusal of covenantal church membership. Do you know, there are countless professing Christians in America today who, who would, would basically say this, if not 
out loud at least in their hearts. I love God. It's Christians I can't stand. And many of them never even darken the doors of a church, much less seek one out where there is where the true gospel is preached and where true believers are found, that they might attach themselves in covenantal bonds and fellowship with the brethren of that particular church. Well, that's a real warning sign. When people who claim to be Christians will not join any church, how can they think to themselves that they really sympathize with what the psalmist says in Psalm 16 here? How how do they think they genuinely feel that the saints in the earth are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight if they don't gravitate to identify with them and love them and minister to them and be ministered to by them in the context of a church. So, to, to face death joyfully, I recommend you, you uh, do this. If you have never been baptized, you confess Christ and be baptized and added formally to the membership of a local church and then live in covenantal bonds of love with your brethren in that place especially. I embrace you and your people. Third major idea of the psalm is in verses 5 and 6. You, Lord, are my everything. The text says, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. This, this seems a little bit obscure to us, but it's not very difficult to understand. When you remember the um, cultural awareness of, of, the, of David in those days, he is speaking about his own spiritual blessings, but he's using three distinct metaphors familiar to the Jews in those days. He's using language that definitely has a connotation uh, with the uh, land apportionment of Canaan after the conquest under Joshua as leader. Uh, you remember, of course, that Israel was delivered by God out of Egypt and came through the wilderness and uh, Joshua became their leader and they went in to Canaan, the promised land, and after the land was subdued, uh, the Lord gave specific directions about how this much of the land in this location goes to tribe one out of the twelve. This much of the land in such and such a late location goes to tribe two of the twelve. This is, for us, it seems like tedious reading in the Old Testament because it says, well, now you start by the river Chebar. No, that's in a different place. Start by the Jordan and go west until you get to this town and then it goes upward and over and but that was very important because that was like the title deeds to the property that the various tribes of, of Israel inherited. So that language is here, but it's used figuratively when he says, uh, Thou maintainest my lot, the lines are fallen, that is the boundary lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. It's, it's a flowery way of saying I love the land that belongs to me. Um, A second um, metaphor in the text is the cup of festal wine in the beginning of verse 5 when he says the Lord is uh, the portion of my cup, uh, the cup of festal wine. And then thirdly, uh, the metaphor is of uh, a large inheritance after one's father dies. He says, I have a goodly heritage in the end of verse 6. And he says, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. It's a colorful way to say that the psalmist prizes God supremely above everything and everyone else. This Lord who is my Lord is my treasure, my love, my destiny, my delight. He is everything to me. Now this is the language, I think you'll admit, of a heart truly right with God. 
Those who do not sincerely feel this way have not yet repented of their idolatry. Every real Christian can identify with the passions, the devout passions of the psalmist as he expresses himself this way. And this, again, is a part of what we must think and do in order to face death joyfully. We can do that only if we prize God supremely because we know that the Lord himself is the substance of the happiness the saints will enjoy after death. Look, I mentioned Gail, my friend Gail, our friend Gail. And I can tell you right now, uh, it hasn't been so long ago that she died, last year actually. But it was not pearly gates and golden streets and a tree that bears 12 different kinds of fruits for the healing of the nations in any literal sense whatsoever that made Gail feel joyful about, about dying and uh, passing on. She told me again and again, it was Jesus Christ. She believed in her heart, it seems, and I, I think her testimony was credible, that the joy of heaven is Jesus himself, and she loved him. And so why shouldn't she be joyful at the prospect of passing from this life into the next where she would be able to behold the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory, the Savior who loved her and gave himself for her? That's, why, that's basically why many people are afraid to die. They don't have this kind of faith and love toward God. God is not their supreme treasure. If they can't say, God, you are my everything, but being able to say that is necessary to be delivered from, from the soul-debilitating fears that come on us as we move toward the grave. Well, look at the next part of the psalm, and I call your attention to verses 7 to 9 now, um, where the psalmist says in substance, my present is blessed. My present is blessed. In other words, even before I die, I know that I am truly well off. From the language here, we see that the psalmist enjoys a high quality of life because not because he's wealthy or because he feels good physically, but because he has a, a spiritual walk. He has a true experience of fellowship with God. And he refers to God three ways in these verses. First of all, the Lord as director, the Lord as defense, and the Lord as delight. Verse 7, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel, or advice, or direction, guidance. That's the sense. I will bless, that is, I will praise the Lord who has given me direction, counsel. The Lord talks to me and tells me how to live. And I will praise Him for that because it's in His counsel that I find eternal life. This is how I escape from ruin, from misery, by listening to the counsel the Lord graciously gives me. And so he praises the Lord for the gift of good counsel. And then he says, my rains also instruct me in the night seasons. The word rains is figurative and some translations have rendered it, my heart instructs me. Or my, it's the idea of my soul, my inner person, my thoughts instruct me. And, and so what I think is going on here is, well, it, let me mention as well, the verb uh, translated instruct here can have the connotation of 
chastisement for wrongdoing or rebuke. And I believe this second line of verse 7 is meant to be interpreted with the first line especially in mind. I will praise the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart convicts me or rebukes me in the night seasons. Here's what I think is, is intended. It was in the daytime particularly that the psalmist studied the scriptures or had the scriptures read to him and learned more and more of God's will. And then at night when he lay down to sleep, he would reflect on what he had learned from scripture and his conscience then especially would rebuke him for his sins. And having been reproved in his conscience, enlightened by Holy Scripture and the counsel of the Lord, he repents and he grows more and more um, holy and faithful to the Lord whom he loves. He praises the Lord as his counselor or director. Listen, facing death joyfully, we can say again, is the fruit of keeping a good conscience which is continually informed and reformed by Holy Scripture. I hope you realize that while conscience is a part of human, human experience is basically a blessing to us, conscience is not infallible. We need the Lord's counsel in His Word to teach us better than we know by our conscience what is right and what is wrong. And the normal Christian life is one of accumulating a, a more keen sense of what God is like and what God wants me to do in my life and what, what displeases Him and the, the devices of the devil and, and the ways to advance the kingdom of God and to give ourselves to these things with increasing uh, excellence and resolve and so forth. Well, that is the way... When, it, when a person like that comes to die, that is the way to face death joyfully. But many people choose to take a different course. They may have been learning scripture and they see more and more that God's way is different than the way they like. And they prefer to keep keep a hold of certain sins that, uh, that, that are different highly abominable to God. And so whether they attend, continue to attend church or not is one matter. But in their hearts, what they're doing is becoming increasingly hard. You know, I think this, it was the Puritans that used the expression sermon proof. They shut down in terms of repentance and, and fresh obedience to God's word. They do not keep a clear conscience. They bloody their conscience with going back again and again to the same old sins. And uh, people like that cannot face death joyfully. Look at verse 8 now. Where the Lord is portrayed as a psalmist's defense. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Um, this phrase, setting the Lord always before him, has been also rendered. I always keep the Lord in front of me. I always keep the Lord in front of me. Now that's not to be understood literally. It's a figure of speech. And surely what it means is deliberate habitual meditation on the Lord, the Lord who is the Almighty God and the Lord who is the gracious Savior, the Almighty who is for me, in other words. This testimony in verse uh, 8, I set the Lord always before me, is to say, I have a perpetual God consciousness. In another place of Scripture, um, the ungodly are described as those who refuse to keep God in their thoughts. This is the opposite of that. I give myself to meditation on the Lord as my habit 
whom I know to be omnipotent and gracious. And when we do that, we have a sense that we are invincible in the Lord. That we are safe and secure because the Lord who is always with us is for us. And so the psalmist says, because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And then next in verse 9, by the way, if it's not obvious, facing death joyfully comes by enjoying God's company constantly. Do you do that? At least do you strive toward that ideal to enjoy God's company constantly. And then in verse 9, the Lord is portrayed as delight. This is the consequence of number 1 and 2. Because the Lord is the psalmist constant counselor, and because the Lord is His continual defense... Uh, he, he discovers that the Lord is also his delight. Therefore, my heart is glad, verse 9, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Um, there are three words chosen to represent the psalmist himself. Heart, glory, and flesh. And basically those mean the inner man, the heart, and his glory is his soul. Some translations even use the word soul instead of glory. And then when he speaks about his flesh, he means his body. And that's the whole person. My inner man and my outer man. And what is it that my inner man and outer man experience together? Well, again, he uses terms that mean very close to the same thing. Gladness. Joy and hope. In other words, emphatically good feelings are mine. Head to toe, inside and out. Here's a, here's a rendering of the verse. That's why my heart celebrates and my mood is joyous. Yes, my whole body will rest in safety. And then the psalm concludes with this celebration of the psalmist's future. He says, my future is joyful. Verses 10 and 11. Pardon. Microphone troubles. Perhaps. The fifth section of the psalm. My future is joyful. Verses 10 and 11. So in addition to the blessed present, he anticipates only good and indescribable good in his future. And the psalm closes with these words. Now this is addressed to God in prayer. And David says to the Lord, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So verse 10 is stated in the negative. Lord, this is what you will save me from. Uh, namely, my soul in hell and my body suffering uh, corruption. And this is, verse 11 is positive, this is what you reserve for my blessedness positively. You will show me the path that leads to life where I find you at the end of the journey in your favorable presence. And being there with you is a matter of pure joy and pleasure to me forever and ever. Now, I believe that David wrote the psalm and that it does have relevance to David. Uh, he's speaking basically about deliverance from death ultimately and welcome into God's favorable presence. Uh, this means 
uh, in verse 10 that he will not suffer the doom of the wicked, which is to go to to hell as one abandoned by God, at least to Sheol in the Old Testament concept of things. And positively, David looks forward to to one who being one who is on the path of life, which ends joyfully in God's presence characterized by eternal pleasures. It's pretty straightforward to understand how this has relevance to David as a holy man uh, a thousand years before Christ. But we should notice that um, he uses the term Sheol in the uh, Hebrew, uh, which often and perhaps even usually means the grave, And the parallel term in the second part of the verse is corruption. And so he's speaking about that experience, which includes both the grave and uh, the rotting of the corpse with along with the entrance of the soul into a gloomy place of misery uh, where um, they are cut off from fellowship with God. Uh, Look. This is, I don't have time now to digress to Old Testament uh, eschatology, the afterlife, but it's not as clear what happens to people when they die in the Old Testament scriptures as it becomes in the New Testament scriptures. But there are hints, there are hints of conscious torment for the wicked after death and comforts for the righteous after death, even in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, and this is the one one Old Testament example I want to show you. This is an oracle of judgment upon uh, the king of Babylon and uh, who is who is doomed to die and to suffer uh, in the afterlife as one who is humbled and uh, cut off from God, if you will. I'm going to read, I want to read the passage starting with verse 4 of Isaiah 14 down through verse 11. And it's highly poetic, which is very characteristic of Isaiah. But just listen to, to it first. Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. Now this is a reference to the king of Babylon. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon saying, since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. The, the picture is that Nebuchadnezzar dies and the survivors on the surface of the earth are celebrating his death because he's not around anymore to, to do evil things. Then in verse 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. And then Isaiah says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And the question of interpretation is whether this refers to the the great archangel that leads the host to wickedness, or whether it's still referring to Babylon, the king, rather Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. I'll leave that for others. But you see... The image blends together the, the laying down of Nebuchadnezzar's body in the grave where the corpse rots and the, and the worms eat him 
it blends together that cemetery image with the experience of the soul in the underworld with other kings who have died and been put aside by the justice of God. And when these other dead kings see dead Nebuchadnezzar coming, who was a king of an empire and ruled many nations, they ridicule him. Oh, what happened to you, great King Nebuchadnezzar? You're not so great anymore, are you? You're down here with us. You can't do anything and so forth. So this is, this is one of the examples of the Old Testament portrayal of what happens to people when they die, particularly sinners who die in God's wrath. Their bodies see corruption and their souls go to the gloomy place uh, of, of the damned. And so when David in Psalm 16 says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in Sheol, nor wilt thou suffer thine Holy One, referring to himself, to see corruption. Instead, you will show me the path of life. Essentially what he's saying is, I know that things are well with me in God's mercy while I'm alive. And in in the future, after I die... Things will be well with me again. I think he had an intelligent hope of resurrection from the dead. And an entrance into eternal glory. And so that's why he was able to face death joyfully. Because he knew that death was a transition to a better state of being. And I draw from this an inference. The more we grasp the blessedness of those who die in the Lord and the stronger our assurance that this will be our blessedness, the more we will face death joyfully. We will know that it is not the grim reaper coming for us, but it is the gracious rescuer, even Christ, that carries us away from this life into the next. It's, it's, like, it's like a husband coming for his bride to take her to be with himself. That's a good thing. Now, I think it would be irresponsible of me, truly I do, as a Christian preacher to expound the 16th Psalm and yet to leave off mention at least of the passage in Acts chapter 2 starting with verse 22. So please turn your Bible there. It's a, a little bit of a longer passage. But this, is, this should be fascinating to every one of you because here we have a divinely inspired account of how one of the apostles understood and used the, the 16th Psalm. And uh, I don't have much to say about it besides reading the text, but I will... A comment briefly. Look at Acts 2.22. This is Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost. And he says to his fellow Jews, unconverted Jews for the most part, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, you well know that Jesus was crucified by these people Peter's addressing on a Friday. The the Friday of Passion Week is the day Jesus was crucified and his body was buried in the tomb and um, it was early on the first day of the week On the third day, not three whole days, but on the third day since he was crucified, that his body came to life again and he left the tomb. Uh, 
In other words, it was it was less than 72 hours that the Lord was dead in the tomb. And he his body was packed with the spices and wrapped in in uh, cloths the way it was customary for for um, loved ones to be uh, buried in those days, especially if they were highly esteemed and the family was well to do. The people to whom Peter was preaching knew this about the story of Jesus. They knew that it was only a part of three days that he was in the tomb and then he was alleged to have been alive again and seen by witnesses. These, this is the account Peter is preaching in Acts 2. You crucified him. God raised him up on the third day. They knew that. It wasn't possible that he, that is that Jesus could be held by the pains of death. And then Peter explains why it was impossible that Jesus should remain in the tomb any longer. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or Sheol, the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now, you should recognize those words because they're very close to the words we read in Psalm 16. In fact, it's a quotation and I think it's a quotation that depends on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. That's part of why it's not exactly the same. But Peter, in his preaching, has just read several verses from Psalm 16, which we have heard and considered. And then he stops to make an important point of interpretation. Men and brethren, he says in verse 29, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David. Now the Psalm 16th Psalm begins in the title with Miktam of David, which might mean a gold, golden, uh, a gold, gold work, like golden, a golden composition, gold of David. Miktam of David. And so it's attributed to David as the writer. But Peter says, Listen, my, my brothers, my Jewish brothers, the patriarch David who wrote the psalm, he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher or grave is with us to this day. Now here Peter is, is saying, look, Peter's body did see corruption in the grave. And this is what the psalm says God will not do. Let the, let the one to whom it pertains, let their body see corruption. And so how do we account for that? Did God fail David? No, God didn't fail David. Peter concludes, Therefore, verse 30, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He... That is, David, seeing this beforehand, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Now, I suppose some scholars might disagree with me. But I, I do not think Peter is denying that there is some sense in which Psalm 16 applies to David. But he is interpreting these words in the end of the psalm about corruption in the grave in a very literal way. And since Jesus' body didn't see corruption in the grave, being buried only for part of three days, Peter interprets Psalm 16 as a prophecy of the Messiah, Jesus, whom God would raise from the dead. And he says, David knew beforehand about the promise that one of his descendants would become the ultimate king of Israel and that God would raise him up and seat him on his throne. 
forever. So David foresaw the reign of Messiah and wrote these words ultimately about him. And this is the key that unlocks the highest sense of the psalm as one that foretells Christ's resurrection. And I cannot take the time to digress, but you know, Christ's resurrection to glory is the Christian's resurrection to glory as well. The saints will be raised to glory like Christ in Christ. Those who trust in Christ will be raised to glorious eternal life in his wake. So I told you from the beginning that the theme of the psalm as I saw it was facing death joyfully. I conclude on that note. Only true Christians in Christ are the ones who are justified to face death joyfully. Do you want to die Possibly with a smile on your face because you're truly happy on the inside. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God helping you, you will have this heavenly hope. And, uh, and be able to face death joyfully. Amen.